Bibles back to Acts chapter 11, as we're going to continue on in our series of, as we look throughout Acts, getting back to the basics of looking at the foundations of the church, and looking specifically in our current, in our current series we're looking through here, at what it is to be led by the Spirit, to walk in that Spirit-led life. And we've been looking at the models of men like Philip, who by the Spirit's guidance brought the gospel out into the desert to the Ethiopian unit. And we saw that man's life change. And we saw Paul, after being confronted by Christ on the road to Damascus and the transformation in his life, and how he immediately went out and took the gospel to the people who he once was working with to persecute Christians, throw them in prison, even put them to death. And now he went to those same violent men that he used to be one of, and now he was bringing the gospel to them. And we saw how after, after three years in Damascus of him preaching to them, that finally enough was enough and they were ready to kill him. And he escaped on to Jerusalem. And the other Christians were afraid to fellowship with him. Until Barnabas, hearing his testimony, gave him a chance, brought him before the apostles to really hear him out and see that this man's conversion was real. To see he truly was living by the Spirit of God in him. So much so that within days, the same people who had put Stephen to death were ready to put him to death as well. And we saw the church smuggle him back off to his hometown in Tarsus to save his life. Then we saw Cornelius and Peter, this Gentile Roman soldier of the government that was oppressing the Jewish people. But this man was a generous, God-fearing man who gave to the poor, he was a man devoted to prayer and seeking after the God of Israel, the one true God. We saw how God sent his angel to have Cornelius send for Peter to hear the gospel. And likewise, the Spirit himself spoke to Peter, first through a vision and then through a clear voice in speaking, telling Peter that he was to go with these men, that this was God's intention. And so Peter put his prejudices aside and he went with these men and he preached the gospel. And we saw this Roman household come to, to faith in Jesus Christ. They too received the Holy Spirit. And so there the testimony went out that even the Gentiles, all the nations, were receiving the Spirit of God and His leadership in their life. And last week Jay looked at it as Peter went back and had to retell this story and all that had happened before his Jewish brothers as they couldn't believe that he would do something to go to these, these pagan Gentile people. And so he testified, no, this was the will of God and challenged their prejudices as God had challenged his own prejudice. And we saw that there is no room for prejudice. There is no room for such divisions among the people of God. Because what there is one Spirit guiding us all. One Lord, one Savior of us all in Jesus Christ. One God and Father over us all. If we are in Christ, there is no room whatsoever in a Spirit-led life among God's people for these sorts of divides. No room for racism, no room for prejudice on poor versus rich, man versus woman. There's just no place for it among God's people. And we saw that clearly shown in this conversation that Peter had. And in the end, we saw that they all rejoiced. They all came after they heard Peter's testimony and rejoiced together that the Spirit had been given even to the Gentiles. And what did that mean? Well, we see in verse 18, when they heard these things, they became silent. And then they glorified God, saying, then God has also granted 
to the Gentiles repentance to life. That all the nations can turn from their sins, put their trust in Jesus Christ, and receive eternal life. They knew this now, without a doubt, as the word of this spread. So as we move on to the chapter, Luke, as he writes this, steps back and gives us a little bit of context as he moves forward. <clears throat> this is again one of those meanwhile statements. While all this was happening, now he's jumping back to reminding you after the people were scattered, after the death of Stephen. When Steve, when back when Paul was still a persecutor of the church, he put Stephen to death, and all the people, the, the, the Christians, were scattered from Jerusalem out to all the regions. And so he says, now when those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only, but some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus, and the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. So, while all this was going on at Jerusalem, and God was revealing, in the calling of Paul, he had, he had, already, he had already said that Paul was going to be his instrument of bringing the gospel to the nations. Lest anyone misunderstood that, and we saw the experience of Peter, and we saw how he was called to preach the gospel to men of the Gentiles of the nations. And we see that testimony that God has also granted the Gentiles repentance unto life. Well, while all this was happening, those who were scattered from the persecution to all regions had ended up traveling as far as these pagan cities, Gentile cities, throughout the Roman Empire. And so they went to the region of Phoenicia, Cyprus, Antioch. These were Gentile cities. These were outside of all Jewish lands. But there were Jewish communities living in them. Because back, back as far back as the, uh, the Babylonian exile towards the end of the Old Testament, when the Jews were scattered out throughout all the nations, many of them never returned to their homeland. You had Jewish communities all across the known world at this point. And so these scattered Christians, not knowing all this yet that was going on in Jerusalem, they were scattered out and they continued to travel from city to city preaching the gospel. But they were only preaching the gospel to their fellow Jews. So we see even there in the scattered regions, this prejudice had initially been there. But something interesting happened. They went and preached the gospel to the Jews who were in Phoenicia, Cyprus, and such. But then some of the Jews from Cyprus and from Cyprus and Cyrene, from these Gentile cities who'd grown up among these people of the nations, who may not have shared quite all the same prejudices, they went on to Antioch and they preached the gospel there, not only to the Jews, but it says to the Hellenists. Some of your translations may say the Grecians, the Greeks, there will be different words there. The word technically is the same word that Acts used earlier for Greek speaking Jews. The word simply means Greek speakers, ones who speak the Greek language. And so it can be used different ways in different contexts. And so some have interpreted this to simply mean they brought it to the Greek-speaking Jews, since that's how Luke used the word earlier in, uh, in Acts chapter 6, for example. Uh, those who Stephen was preaching the gospel to were the Hellenists or the Greek-speaking Jews. When there's the divide in the church over the widows and the orphans who were being neglected, the divide was between the Palestinian Jews and the, the Hellenists, the Greek-speaking Jews, and the divide between those families and the church had to work out those prejudices. So that has come up with the Greek-speaking Jews. But here it seems to be in context pointing something, <coughs> something different. Because we have that they would only preach to the Jews as opposed to who? Well, based on everything that we've seen in the stories leading up to this, the Jews instead of the Gentiles. So here, this probably means people who are ethnic Greeks, people who are Greek by blood, born Greeks, Greek culturally and nationality. 
And so here the term Hellenist is probably, these were, these were former Greek cities before the Romans conquered them. So these were probably people who, who were not Jewish at all. The term Hellenist here refers to people who were Greek, ethnic Greeks. And so these Jews that came from Judea, they went to these Greek cities and preached the gospel only to the Jews. But the Jews who grew up in these Greek cities took that gospel not only to their fellow Jews, but they brought it on to their Greek neighbors. They went into the city of Antioch and they preached it to everybody. And so without Peter and the apostles even having to go tell them, hey, the gospel's for all the nations, some of these people went ahead and got it. They got the idea. They started preaching the gospel. And what does it say? The hand of God was with them. God blessed this decision on their part to not act in prejudice and begin <laughs> preaching the gospel to their Greek neighbors. To go on to Antioch and preach the gospel, not to Jews, but also to Greeks. But because that happened, something very interesting happened here at Antioch that had not happened before. The Ethiopian eunuch, he was Ethiopian, he was a Gentile, he received the gospel. Then what happened to him? <coughs> we don't know. Philip went on somewhere else. He went on back to Ethiopia. Cornelius and his household, Peter went and preached the gospel to him. Then Peter went back to Judea. Where did Cornelius go? Well, presumably, him and his household continued on as they were already doing. They continued to worship God through Jesus Christ. They continued to be believers in the one true God and in their Savior, Jesus Christ, <clears throat> but to worship separately. But here in Antioch, you had Jews and Greeks coming together as one church, worshiping side by side. They were preaching indiscriminately to both, and both would have been coming together to worship together. You had the first multi-ethnic church planted here in the city of Antioch. A beautiful first in the history of Christianity and in God's work. Where now it's not just Gentiles can hear the gospel. Not even just Gentiles can receive the Holy Spirit. Now it is Gentiles can join us as one people, as one church, as one body. And so as this happened, verse 22, then news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch, when he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all that with, the, uh, that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many were added to the Lord. And so they hear what's going on, and they send, they send Barnabas on, a leader in the Jerusalem church, this good, strong, passionate man of the faith that we've, we've seen show up several times before. A man truly under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And they send him on to join what's going on there, to see what's going on, to assess it. He comes in, and you would think, okay, they're going to send this missionary. He's going to come and just take over. This great leader sent by the apostles, he gets there. He sees what's going on, and all he does is encourage them to keep doing what they're doing. What's going on there is already great. He encourages, he stirs them on, he joins in with them in what they're doing, but he joins in as an equal. Barnabas jumps right into the ministry that they have going on and just encourages them, stirs them on in what they're already doing because they were doing the work of God. The hand of God was with them. And it says, many came to the Lord. Many came. Then Barnabas, Barnabas went ahead and left, left at this point. Barnabas departed, and he went to Tarsus to seek out Saul, the former Corsican persecutor, the man who'd given his life to Christ to the point where the, the other persecutors now wanted to kill him. This man who had since then had to go and spend a few years hidden in his hometown. Barnabas went to get him back in the ministry. Probably remembered his testimony of his own calling. What was it? What was it that that calling was on his life? God had specifically said to Ananias 
who had gone and laid his hand, given him his sight back, the man who baptized him. He is my chosen instrument to preach the gospel to the nations. The gospel's going to the nations now. It's happening. This first multi-ethnic church is planted here. Barnabas goes. He encourages them. He sees the beautiful thing that's going on there. It's growing. God's moving. And he's like, Saul's got to get in on this. Saul needs to see this. He needs to join in in what we're doing here. And he leaves. He goes, finds, goes to Tarsus, his hometown. He seeks out Saul, finds where he is. And he brings him back. And so it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church, taught a great many people, and the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. A couple things we need to know there in that, the way that, that story concludes. First of all, a, a minor thing just to keep in mind as we move through the rest, of, the rest of Acts. Saul here is still called Saul. A lot of people think that Saul's name changes to Paul. That when he came to Christ, he stopped being Saul and started being Paul. That's actually not true. His Jewish name was Saul, and it remained Saul for the rest of his life. He will continue to be called Saul through the rest of the book of Acts, mostly in Jewish context. But Paul was a Roman citizen, born into a Roman family. He also had a Roman name. So among Gentiles, when he's sent out as a missionary to the Roman world, he will go by his Roman name. You will see him called Paul. And the author will go back and forth on which one he calls him. So this is not a case of a man whose, name's changed, whose name changes. We do see that happen sometimes in Scripture. Someone has a life-changing experience with God and their name changes. Well, Saul, that's not the case. That's a common misconception. He was Saul, he was Paul, he's both. Um, but so Saul comes, Saul still at this time. Uh, Saul comes, he joins, joins in with this ministry. They're preaching the gospel, they're teaching people, and after a whole year, they're growing. Gentiles, Jews, all coming together, joining into this one body of Christ. And it says that the disciples were first called Christians here at Antioch. That name we still bear today, what we still call ourselves, that first began not in the first preaching of Jesus. Not on the day of Pentecost when the Spirit came and began that ministry. Not in the initial preaching of the apostles. It began here when Gentiles and Jews came together as one people. Why? Well, Christians, Christian, would be a Greek way of saying of the party of Christ. This is the first time that the Gentiles begin to really take notice of Christianity of this movement. And they come up with a name for it. And they look at it and they see a distinct identity. It's not just Jewish people arguing over some ancient prophecy. They see a distinct difference. There's something different about this community. <laughs> of Greeks and Jews coming together in peace to, as one people in worship of the same God, following this Christ, this anointed one, this, this divine king that they're seeking after. And so they called them Christians, the party of Christ, the party of the anointed one. And so here they, 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 they begin to develop this unique identity in the eyes of the world who up to this point, the world would have just seen this as some argument within Judaism. But now they see something different is happening here. They recognize a distinction. Over the course of this year, something happened that the world took notice of. The nations looked in and saw there was a difference in this community. There was a difference in these people. This should be what we are. Our community should look at us as a church, as a family of Christians from every background. I mean, look, look around this room. Really, do it literally right now. Look around. Look at each other. We are not... But by the world's standards, we would not be the same people. 
we would not be one community. We are businessmen and bankers. We are. I chop onions for a living. For goodness sake. <laughs> School teachers. We have uh, young and old, some well off, some financially in deep struggle. We have people from various backgrounds, various, various cultural perspectives. And granted, we are all currently of one skin color. As we continue to bring the gospel out, I hope that changes. <coughs> but I'll tell you this. Many of you, before I came to Christ, before you came to Christ, we wouldn't have fellowshiped. We wouldn't have come together as family. We would not have been friends. In Christ, we are brothers and sisters. We are one people. And we need to live in such a way that the community around us sees that. Our complete and utter devotion and love to one another needs to be evident to all. Furthermore, the gospel needs to go out through us exactly as it did here. Not just through professional pastors and missionaries. As you look here, the professional leaders of the church couldn't keep up with the gospel going out. It was staying, it was staying ahead of them. They had to hear word, hey, guess what? There's this great new church in Antioch. They didn't know anything about it. They had to send people to catch up with what was already going on. Why? Because every believer was taking the gospel to their friends, their family, their neighbors, the people that met in the street, whoever they could go find. Wherever they went, they were bringing the word with them to every person. And then the people they brought it to were bringing it to more people. And the people they brought it to were bringing it to more people. And so people who you may not, who you may not ever have a chance to come in contact with, the people who you come in contact with will come in contact with others. What impact are you having on them? Are you bringing them to Christ so that they will bring others to Christ? We know for a fact the gospel went out. All historical records testify to this plainly. The gospel went out most powerfully and most fully throughout the known world, not through a handful of professional missionaries, but through every Christian bringing the gospel to those they worked with, to those they lived beside, to those who were all around them. That is what changed the world. The world was utterly transformed. In fact, we have very early, only decades after the New Testament, documents from pagan Roman scholars writing, mocking Christianity. And you know what their mockery of Christianity was? That Christians had the audacity to believe that someone working in a butcher shop would have something valuable spiritually to teach. That some, that some woman, stay-at-home mom, could communicate something of spiritual value to their neighbors. They mocked this. They found it laughable that the average person could know powerful truth and bring that to other people. Why were they singling this out? Because that's the way Christianity was spreading. They couldn't understand why people would gather together in the shoemaker's shop to hear the divine truths of God. But they did. Because every single believer, it wasn't about, oh, the educated few. It wasn't about the elite. Christianity is not a religion of monks and priests and ivory towers, but it is a religion of all the people of God bestowed with the Holy Spirit proclaiming the Word of God to a world in need. I mean, when you look at the Old Testament, who was speaking by the power of the Holy Spirit? The prophets. Then a time comes under the New Covenant when the Holy Spirit is, as the prophet Joel said, poured out on all flesh. What does that mean? All the people of God, indiscriminately, man, woman, 
adult, child, rich, poor, doesn't matter. We all, have, if you have truly repented of your sin and put your trust in Jesus Christ, He has poured His Spirit into you. His Spirit is your guide and counselor leading you. And you have a valuable message to this world from God. And yes, like those pagan scholars of old, many in this world will find that laughable. But it is the blessed reality of the Christian community. It is who we are. We are a prophetic people. A people given the Spirit to all go and proclaim this message to all who will hear. And it is when each of us takes that word from person to person. And as they receive, they take that word from person to person. That the church spreads powerfully. And our family grows. Has that not been true? Even in our own community here. Even in this small fellowship we have. Libby, why are you here? Beth and Jay brought the gospel to you. Alicia's not here today. Why, is Malisha, why, why did Malisha come to church? <laughs> because Libby. Beth shares with Libby. Libby shares with Malisha. The, the chain goes on and on. People come into the faith as we continue to proclaim. And then those who heard our pro proclamation, they receive the Spirit and they go on to proclaim. However little you may know, you take it and you teach it to others. And God will speak through you. This is how the church grows. This is our mission. This is our purpose. This is our identity and who we are. And the outside world should see this. They should see those who are coming in and learning from us, joining in and bringing it out to their friends and neighbors. And the love that's being shown, the reception in this, this fellowship of faith, they should see something different about this people of equals, of brothers and sisters who love one another. Some will mock it. Some will receive it and embrace it. But none should be able to look at us and not notice it. We are Christians. We are the people, the followers of Jesus Christ, the anointed King, the divine Messiah, the Son of God. So let's go out together and live like it. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, we thank you. We thank you for the identity that you've given us in your Son. We thank you for the people that we get to be, the family that I have. And these men and women before me here. God, I don't know where I'd be or what I would do without them. And God, I know that many of them don't know where they would be without each other. And God, I thank you for each and every one of them, and I thank you for the privilege it is to be a part of your covenant people. God, I pray that as I go, I go about my day, that God, those working in the kitchen beside me, none of them would go this week without hearing of my Savior, Jesus Christ. Those to whom I serve food to, that they would see in me a testimony of the Spirit of God working in my life and hear your name praised. God, I pray the same for every person in this room, their classmates, their co-workers, the waiters at the restaurant that they eat, the cashiers at the stores they buy from, that each of them would be a testimony to every person to whom they meet. Indeed, but even more so in word, explaining truly the message of the gospel. That others of all people, of all walks of life, turning from their sin, could come together and join this beautiful community of all nations that is Christianity, that 
is your covenant, your people in Christ. God, we thank you and we praise you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray.